Hello and welcome dear students and other folks who stumbled across this video on YouTube. My name is Leonhard Dobusch. I am a professor of organization at University of Innsbruck and this lecture on open science data and commons is part of the collaborative open course on organizing in times of crisis. The reason for including uh, the topic of open science in this course is the belief that openness of research is always important, but particularly so in a situation of crisis, such as the current COVID-19 or coronavirus situation. The reason that research generally is a collective endeavor uh, is also the reason um, why a certain degree of, of openness in science has always been a prerequis prerequisite for um, coming to scientific um, conclusions. If we even believe that there is something such as scientific progress, it's only possible because we build upon insights from our predecessors and colleagues, or in the most famous words by many people, but among others Isaac Newton, if we are able to see further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. This is even true when scientific progress means overturning previously and wrongly held beliefs. This is also only possible if we have access to these other works. But going beyond mere access, science is also a collective endeavor in the sense that we as scientists, as researchers, depend on others, on peers, to evaluate and criticize our own works. In this sense, Robinson Crusoe, alone on an island, can't do research because he's cut off from scientific communities, which are essential for um, doing research and also for correcting for blind spots and for evaluating whether progress has been made or not. Recognizing that science is and always has necessarily been a collective endeavor, Robert K. Merton, um, in his uh, prominent imperatives for modern science, even poses that science requires communism. Communism in the sense that all scientists should have common ownership of scientific goods to promote collective collaboration. Secrecy is the opposite of this norm. So, very general, in a very general sense, um, scientific uh, work, uh, research, uh, depends on access to works of others, depends on a certain type of openness, open access, if not free access, to be even possible. But then, when we, um, when researchers nowadays try to publish and distribute their most important findings, they are regularly confronted with quite a different reality. This quote here on this slide is taken from a standard copyright form of a large academic publisher uh, that authors are required to sign after their article had been approved already by editors and fellow peer reviewers. So they have to sign uh, a, a form that says, I hereby assign to in this case, a very large international publishing house, exclusively all my right, title and interest in said article, including, without limitation, the copyright therein. The consequence of such forms is that in many disciplines, copyright of research conducted and evaluated by publicly funded universities, research institutions and funding bodies is transferred free of charge to large corporate publishing houses, which then make large profits. We are talking profit margins of more than 25%, at least by the um, largest uh, publishing houses that share over 60% of the market. Uh, and they make these large profits by selling research outputs to public libraries, again, publicly funded institutions, at continuously increasing prices. Of course, Limited library budgets mean that the majority of researchers therefore does not have access to the majority of research output of their fellow colleagues. At least this was the case prior to the internet and the open access and open science movement that this lecture is about. 
if we just stick with the internet for, for now, um, given that many researchers don't have access to important scientific journals via their libraries, they turn to so-called shadow libraries, such as, and that's the most prominent one, Sci-Hub, which uh, offers scientific articles for free to anyone. Sci-Hub on its webpage um, even uh, states that it's uh, devoted to goals such as uh, free access to knowledge for all. So while Sci-Hub and other scheduled libraries are clearly in violation of copyright law, Sci-Hub makes a strong moral case for its offerings, stating that it fights inequality knowledge access and supports the open access movement in science. And um, when you look at what researchers that turn to Sci-Hub to access their papers think, uh, whether they have at least some guilty conscience for downloading pirated papers, their responses in this survey um, make it quite clear that they regret nothing. I, to be honest, completely understand and share this position. The reason is that the whole scientific publication process is organized by the scientific community with authors writing and handing in articles, editors deciding whether, the immediately, whether to immediately reject a submission or to send it out to other researchers for peer review. And often after several rounds of this peer review, review process, it's again the editors that decide on whether to publish an article or not. And the authors, they don't get paid for submitting the article. Editors sometimes get paid, but at least most of the associate editors, they don't get a lot of money and they could not live off these editing uh, duties or what they receive for that. And the reviewers, again, they don't get paid in most cases for the work as a reviewer. So actually all the important stuff here that is writing the article and evaluating the quality of the article is done and by the scientific community, by peers. That's why it's called peer review. And only then, after you've successfully completed this process of peer evaluation, which can be quite hard, only then <clears throat> you get to sign a copyright form and the article gets published. And the open access movement originally only tried to intervene at this point. So leaving the peer review process unaddressed, the open access and the whole scientific process that leads to the publication unaddressed, uh, the open access movement wants at least publicly funded research to be openly available to anyone. And with openly available, it's not just meant to have access to the paper, but also that the study and increasingly research data is um, openly licensed, so not just openly, uh, if, uh, there's not just open access uh, to this content, but also that the content is uh, published under a license, uh, which um, makes it easy uh, to reuse uh, these uh, findings and also the data without the ne any further need of clearing copyrights, and that it is provided in open formats, which make it easy to engage in reuse and replication practices, both of which should uh, help to improve science after all. Um, the whole open access movement um, has, uh, has started in the early 2000s and over the past two decades, um, an increasing number of, of, science, of research and scientific institutions have um, supported the idea of making at least publicly funded research openly available by default to anyone. And so increasingly and powerful actors such as research funding bodies, such as the European Research Council, which funds excellent research in Europe or the European Commission in its uh, Horizon 2020 um, research funding program, or in the US, the um, National Institute of Health, they all have public access policies and they all require anyone applying for funds to make their outputs openly available in such a manner as I've just described. And uh, over the past two decades, we could also observe some change in the academic publishing landscape or sector. So pioneered particularly in the natural sciences by open publishers, open access publishers such as the Public Library of Science, short PLOS. Um, open access principles have already reached the humanities, for example, with the platform Open Library of the Humanities, which hosts a whole bunch, a growing number of open access journals in the social sciences and the humanities. And a little late to the party, 
but uh, very recently the new journal uh, of the European Group of Organization Studies called Organization Theory is also has also been founded as a full open access journal without article processing fees. So people that manage to get their article published in Organization Theory um, also uh, can be sure that their article is immediately openly available to anyone. Sadly, other important, uh, very important journals in the field of organization and management studies, such as, for example, all the Academy of Management journals, they are still not openly available, but hopefully this is something that might change over the next couple of years. Um, while all these examples are newly founded outlets or platforms, there's also a growing number of cases where researchers in editorial boards put pressure on publishers to switch to full open access publishing models, and they have leverage, as was evidenced uh, by the case of Lingua, one of the leading linguistic journals, when publisher Elsevier, the largest publishing house in the, uh, academic publishing house in the world, did not want to switch to an open access model, the whole editorial board left Lingua and founded Glossa, taking their reputation and most of the authors with them. But the title of this lecture is Open Science, not Open Access, and the reason is that over the last years, researchers across disciplines increasingly reached the consensus that mere access to final results and maybe underlying data sets is not enough. Instead, um, in the words of open science researcher Katja Meyer, open science is the idea that scientific knowledge of all kinds should be openly shared as early as is practical in the research process. So what are other kinds of scientific knowledge? What is uh, Katja Meyer here referring to? Uh, it's actually a huge, huge, huge variety of different kinds and types of, of uh, scientific knowledge. And the list here is, is far from complete. It's uh, just the exemplary list. So it includes open research data, open data, and research materials. It includes the source code. Increasingly, research depends on software uh, and uh, actually coding software, also statistic software such as R, uh, the statistic program R, are available open source and uh, all the kinds of methods should also be, and, and methodological tools should be made available also in an openly reusable manner. Also the instructions that are necessary to use and apply these models should be openly available. Also uh, open educational materials should be provided research should be evaluated in a different way, openly evaluated, not behind the closed doors of journals, not only behind the closed doors of peer review, review processes in journals, and maybe even broader strands of the society should be invited to take part in research endeavors, um, leading, uh, which is uh, currently discussed under the label of citizen science. And all these different kinds of knowledge together they are summarized under the umbrella term of uh, open science. And while we cannot discuss all these types of knowledge here, let me give some specific examples also with relation to the current COVID-19 crisis. So for example, when talking about open research data and materials, um, given that responding uh, to a pandemic in particular requires swift actions. All over the world, we find pressure to share and aggregate all kinds of research data, materials, sources, and methods that deal with COVID-19. Open access publisher Public Library of Science, I'm, that I mentioned before, uh, for example, um, even made a promise to forward all studies submitted to uh, PLOS journals and data related to COVID-19 to the World Health Organization and its open data portal immediately after submission and prior to the completion of the review process. But it's not just the World Health Organization, the WHO, but also uh, the European Union and most of its member states have established open data portals to allow open access to current corona data and enabling and maximizing the number of researchers um, to work on the best available base of data. Another example, or another aspect of open science, which relates actually to Humboldt's ideal of the unity between research and teaching is open education. And actually by taking this course and watching this lecture, you are already uh, part of this aspect of open science. The whole course material is openly licensed and available in open formats without access restrictions online at times of crisis. 
org. And finally, and as a third and final example, let's look at open evaluation. Uh, this means that not just reviewers of a journal, but literally anyone willing and able is invited to evaluate works of research. One way to achieve that are preprint service. The most prominent one, archive.org, but over the last uh, most recent years, actually, we've observed uh, a steep increase in terms of um, preprint archive, preprint service across disciplines. And uh, what uh, preprint servers um, deliver are uh, articles that are uploaded to preprint servers parallel to their submission to a journal. And again, in a health crisis such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, even fast review processes might cost lives and both scientific peers, but also educated journalists check preprint servers every day for new insights. Um, Another uh, approach uh, that tries to open uh, the, the, the evaluation of research outputs and findings is the open peer review approach. Open peer review um, addresses the traditional review process of journals and uh, it actually is also an umbrella term uh, summarizing several uh, open peer review practices that need not be combined. So for example, it's not necessarily for open peer review to share the identity of reviewers, but this might be one way. Um, but you might keep the reviewer identities private, but share their review reports. That's actually something that very prominent journals such as Nature um, are currently uh, testing. So they are, uh, they are engaging in more open practices in their review processes. Or it might mean, might mean to invite broader audiences to engage in review, so to not just invite specific reviewers, but also to put it out there uh, in its uh, in a preprint uh, fashion, and then to invite anyone to provide uh, comments. Taken together, uh, open science is a huge bundle of different practices, which should help to bring research closer to the ideals of Newton and Merton mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. But how do we organize science more openly and not just to fight uh, the current pandemic, but to improve scientific knowledge creation overall? And when organizing open strategies in science, uh, it's important to emphasize and also regularly evaluate whether key goals, such as sharing and collaboration, transparency and reproducibility, reusability and social participation are realized or at least improved. To do so, Several levels, offer points of departure, also depending on where you, your institution, are situated in the collective scientific endeavor. For example, research institutions and funding bodies can make certain practices mandatory. That's what happened with the open access mandates. That might also and is already increasingly happening with regard to open data mandates, and there might be other mandates in the future. Uh, actually, some, me, I'm as a researcher, I'm often happy, I'm, I'm really f in favor of open access mandates because once there is a mandate by a founding body, the publishers cannot force me to give them the exclusive right to my research outputs just because I want to publish in these journals, which is again necessary to apply for further research funding or to, to have a career um, in um, my discipline. But then there are other uh, levels with other activities. Um, so when we talk about make um, open scientific practices rewarding, this means that uh, activities such as creating and sharing a data set should be recognized by funding bodies or for academic career decisions and not just publication of, of articles. This would provide an incentive to invest in building openly available databases and resources. Within a scientific community, increasing openness needs to become a shared goal or even a norm um, that if, if with uh, researchers that are that are violating this norm are also to some degree punished in terms of loss of reputation maybe. And um, developing user interfaces and infrastructures for sharing all kinds of scientific knowledge would make it easier for broader strands of researchers to actually open up their research. This is something that we can also observe currently with several of these new preprint servers, with uh, articles, uh, with, with journal um, management systems, um, 
allowing for sharing data sets or additional resources, materials in uh, accompanying articles that have completed a peer review process. As you can see, uh, this whole open science um, issue is a moving target and it's rapidly developing, but and definitely uh, if we want to see something good in this uh, corona, coronavirus or COVID-19 crisis, it is that ideas of open science have um, gotten a boost and uh, and I, I would say the that more aspects of the scientific process and research process are now under pressure to be uh, conducted in a more open manner and uh, and overall I would consider this a good thing but of course you are free to to disagree maybe also in your in your research essay in this course um, I thank you for the attention and uh, feel free to approach me with any questions that have arisen throughout this lecture.